So we've been talking about kinetics, the study of reaction rates, and the factors that affect reaction rates. And yesterday we talked about those factors, and we finished up with reaction profiles. And again, the do now, I really wanted to review a few concepts, but also visually see the effect of a catalyst on the reaction profile. So we know a catalyst speeds up the rate of the reaction without being consumed itself. It does so by providing an alternative pathway that has a lower activation energy. And again, I just wanted to draw that in for you. We're going to switch gears now and we're going to talk about chemical equilibrium. And this is going to be a little bit different than anything that we have talked about thus far because previously we were talking about reactions that only had a forward arrow indicating that the reaction went to completion. You started with reactants, you had a limiting reagent that got used up completely, determined how much product was generated. Way back in the stoichiometry chapter, you were able to figure out limiting <coughs> reagent, theoretical yields, percent yields, etc. This chapter is a little bit different because for the first time you're going to see reactions that go forward and backward. So your learning goal, which I didn't post yet because the other class is still in the kinetics with this odd, odd, even, even, what you're going to see in this chapter is you're going to learn about reversible reactions. You're going to learn about equilibrium constants, how to write them, what they mean, how to interpret them, how to solve them. And you'll get a better feel for that today as we work through. And then we'll also be talking about Le Chatelier's principle, which helps you understand that if you stress a system at equilibrium, what the system does to at least partially undo that stress. So this chapter is very mathy and conceptual in the second half. The kids really enjoy this chapter. I think you will too. We have a totally cool lab to do on it later, um, probably toward the end of next week, beginning of the following. And I will post your schedule so you get a feel for what we're doing when and when you will be assessed. So as we said, with a chemical reaction, for example, magnesium reacting with hydrochloric acid to generate mag chloride and hydrogen gas, you can see the arrow only going in the forward direction, indicating the reaction goes to completion. And you did a similar reaction this year with zinc. Now what we're going to look at are reversible reactions. So these reactions all go to completion, and we've looked at some of them during the year. For example, if you have hydrochloric acid dissolved in water, you generate chloride ion and hydronium ion, and you would know the reaction goes to completion by conductivity. You would see that if you hook this reaction to a light source, the light bulb would illuminate. Earlier in the year, we reacted sodium chloride with silver nitrate. We generated sodium nitrate and silver chloride, which is a white precipitate. That's an experiment you did do earlier in the year. The reaction goes to completion. You get a solid substance from aqueous substances. Down here, we see a lot of rust on houses um, from sprinkler systems. We know that iron, when it oxidizes, forms iron three oxide, which is rust, that's a solid. This reaction goes to completion. Chemical equations in which you only have a forward arrow go to completion. But not all reactions do go to completion. Sometimes you have reactants left over. Sometimes products can react with one another and reform reactants. And that's what we're going to see with reversible reactions. So it says products may form reactants. If you have nitrogen dioxide, that's a brown gas. It reacts with itself to generate the colorless gas, dinitrogen tetroxide. This colorless gas can react with itself and reform nitrogen dioxide. So that's the reverse reaction, and you can see this 
by looking at a change in color. And so instead of writing the two reactions twice, what we do is we just write it with this double arrow where you're looking at the forward reaction, the front arrow or the top arrow, and the reverse reaction shown here. That is a reversible reaction. It indicates that both nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen tetroxide react continually. So it goes forward and backward and forward and backward. You can think of it in terms of maybe these going in and out of a hive. They don't all just go in. Some go in, some come out. In, out, in, out. You can think about our parking lot. It's very dynamic. Cars come in, cars come out, especially in the morning. In, out, in, out, pick up. Very, very dynamic type process. When these two reactions occur at equal rates, we say that the reaction is in a state of chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium defined is when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. And as I said, it is a highly dynamic process, not a static process we can look at what happens when a reaction reaches equilibrium graphically. I'll show you this because we can follow changes in concentrations of reactants and products when equilibrium is approached. For example, if we look at this reaction that we looked at previously, we will see reactants, do they get consumed or generated? consume, they get used up. So we can see here that nitrogen dioxide has decreasing concentration over time until it plateaus. When it plateaus, you're at a region of equilibrium. Dinitrogen tetroxide gets generated, so you start with none, and then you generate it until equilibrium is reached. So the equilibrium region occurs at this time and it's recognizable with those plateaus. You'll also see that this line is at about twice as high as this line because of the two to one mole ratio of reactants to products. This one also shows the formation of ammonia from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. If you just had the graph alone, you could determine what your reactants and products are. For example, the hydrogen concentration is decreasing, as is the nitrogen concentration, because hydrogen and nitrogen are reactants. The ammonia gets generated, so this substance increases in concentration until equilibrium is achieved. And again, you can see the 3 to 1 mole ratio of hydrogen gas to nitrogen gas. So there's a lot of information you could pull there and you could figure out which were reactants and which were products. One of the best examples of a reversible reaction is what happens when you have to jump start your car because your battery is dead. So car batteries contain sulfuric acid, you have lead and lead four oxide, and the forward reaction shows that lead, lead four oxide, and sulfuric acid are reacting to form lead two sulfate, water, and energy. Now your car can go. When your battery is dead, you hook your jumper cables to it, although they're telling you you really shouldn't jump start your cars anymore. It's not good for your battery. But you drive the reaction in reverse, where you have this sub these two substances now. You hook up your cables to supply the energy, and you can drive the reaction in reverse. I mentioned the bees in and out of the hive. If you've ever gone to a football game, baseball game, concert, etc., not everybody's sitting in their seat. So some people go to the bathroom, they get up, get in line, da 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 da. They go to get a drink, a hot dog, and I you probably can get a hot dog and a soda now at a ball game for oh, maybe ten dollars. Um, so 
there's a lot of movement, a very dynamic type process, okay? You can think with equilibrium when the bell rings, people are moving in, people are moving out. But even during the day, is everybody just in the rooms all day long? No, people constant movement, dynamic versus static. So chemical equilibrium is when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. And we show equilibrium with those double-headed arrows. I usually show them like this, but you could make a complete forward and a complete backward arrow, and I'll illustrate that in a few minutes. We typically look at concentration, but you can look at masses of reactants or products. You can look at temperature. You can look at color, conductivity. And we are going to do a colorimetric type assay in our next lab where your reactant is pink and when you generate product, it's blue. And the colorimetric assays, although not quantitative, they're qualitative, they're really nice because you know whether the forward or reverse reaction is favored based on the color that you see. I, let me do a quick look-see. I'm pretty sure that I have, they don't usually give many of the color metric, but I think I've got one. That's the image I showed you. I want a little movie. I don't have a little movie there. I know I had one here, but I think the school district blocks it now. Quick look, see. Nope. You can see equilibrium here, although it's not quite the same. What you've got here is you've got water in the liquid state. And now as we equilibrate, water is going to escape to the gaseous. And you can see this. The rates are not equal yet because this rate's still greater than that rate. But as more and more particles escape from the liquid state to the gaseous state, ultimately equilibrium is reached when the rate of the forward reaction, that is vaporization, is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, that's condensation. So that does illustrate, although I really, um, this also is just a simulation of what we looked at, A going to B. So which concentration will increase, A or B? B, because it gets generated. This is a one-to-one -one mole ratio, so they should meet up at the same point. So the rate of the forward reaction is decreasing, this is increasing, and now equilibrium is established, and this is where you're going to get your plateau, okay? I don't have the colorimetric assay. I'll try and find it at the break. I had one, but I can't, I can't open it. Okay, so what we want to talk about is the equilibrium constant. Everything looks scary the first time you see it, but you're going to find this to be really, really straightforward. You're going to be very good at it. It's very mathy. I think you'll find it to be extremely easy. Same general equation that we've talked about before. Reactants, products, lowercase letters, stoichiometric coefficients, as we've talked about for several chapters now. An equilibrium constant expression, constant is K, capital K, EQ for equilibrium. It's not EG, it's EQ. Concentration of products on top, raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. Concentration of reactants on the bottom, raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. The numerator contains the concentration of products, the denominator the reactants, the exponents are the stoichiometric coefficients. Products on top, remember pot, products on top. 
For example, if you were generating phosphorus pentachloride from phosphorus trichloride and chlorine gas, Initially, the reactants react to form product. As the reaction continues on, the rate of the forward reaction is going to decrease, as we saw previously, and the rate of the reverse reaction will increase. At equilibrium, the rate of the forward and reverse reactions are equal. You put the product, phosphorus pentachloride, in brackets, because that represents concentration, raised to the first power. Concentration of reactants in the denominator, each raised to the first power. And then ultimately you know that you'll be supplied with concentration, have to solve for KEQ, interpret KEQ, and later on you could be given KEQ, be given this, and solve for that. And it's all very straightforward. One point to make, and we'll come back to this later on, the value of KEQ remains constant only if temperature remains constant. Temperature is the only factor that can alter the value of KEQ. There are factors that alter equilibrium, but they don't alter the value of KEQ. Only temperature can alter the value of KEQ. What's the matter? So go get it. In terms of your KEQ expressions, only, only gases and aqueous substance are included in KEQ expressions. You do not put solids or liquids in KEQ expressions. Their concentrations are not altered, and so you do not put solids or liquids in KEQ expressions, and I'll give you several examples here. Ram. To solve it? Um, no, okay. not at this level. All right, so it says write the equilibrium constant expressions for the following equations. So let's do these together. Once you learn how to write them, you can solve and interpret them. I'm going to flip gears. You have everything in front of you. We want to write the KEQ expression. So for number one, we have KEQ. Do we put products or reactants in the numerator? Products. The product is sulfur trioxide. So I put it in brackets and I raise it to the second power because of the coefficient of 2 of sulfur trioxide. Reactants in brackets. Coefficient of 2 becomes exponent of 2. And oxygen gas. And that is an equilibrium constant expression. Yeah. I've got this. All right, so, but it, it really is it, but there's just a few things to be aware of, and we'll see those in the other examples. So in the second example, KEQ, raise your hand and do it with me. Okay, Cassidy.
You got it. Good job. Okay, now remember, only gases or aqueous substances are included in KEQ expressions. So let's try number three. I'll do this one with you, and then we'll give four a shot. On number three, I see carbon, a solid, reacting with carbon dioxide, a gas, generates carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is my product. It goes in the numerator. It's raised to the power of two. Why do I not put carbon in? Because no solid. Okay, this is an equilibrium, constant expression, products go in the numerator, reactants go in the denominator, coefficients become exponents. Number four looks a little cranky. It's actually the reverse reaction of what you're going to be doing in your lab. You only include gases and in aqueous substances. It says cobalt, open parentheses, water, close parentheses, 6, 2 plus. That's actually a complex ion. Basically what you have is cobalt 2 chloride hexahydrate, and the water molecules are essentially attached to the cobalt 2 ion, so it looks a little funny, but you just put it in brackets. Now that's a charge, it stays there, coefficient of one. You've got six chloride ions, I'm sorry, four chloride ions. So the stoichiometric coefficient of four becomes the exponent. And then you've got as such, and we don't include water in the liquid state. Now water in the gaseous state, you would. So that one looks a little funny. Be very careful with it. Make sure you've got charges in there. Don't dump the charges, because the KEQ expression won't be hard. Now I won't give you one like this on your quiz, but I think I did it on your test, because your lab deals with this. So there'll be a lot of interpretation from the lab. KEQ expressions. Justin, what goes in the numerator, reactants or products? Um, products. Products, you got it, all right? Yeah. KEQ expression. Yeah. Oh, you want me to give you one real quick? No, you got it. Oh, it was just a little question. I knew you right. knew the answer. That's why I picked on you. All right. So now you know how to write KEQ expressions. Now we need to learn how to calculate them and interpret them. Okay? Are you with me? This is easy, right? We love easy. Ashley, are you okay? I know you're tired. She slept for two hours. All right. You guys are so silly. All righty. We have a little more to do, and then I'll let you practice, practice, practice. What about the lab? We're not doing the lab today? It's all linked together. Yeah, we can do that too. Shh. All righty. Now we want to know how to calculate, okay? If the concentrations of reactants and products are provided, you can calculate KEQ and interpret it. Now, because the units of KEQ are dependent on the KEQ expression, KEQ can have very variable units. To make life simple, we just do not use units for KEQ. No units for KEQ. So you can't lose a point for units there unless you put them in and they're not right. So no units for KEQ. It says use the corresponding equations below and the concentrations of reactants and products provided to calculate the value of KEQ. So now what we want to do is we want to calculate the value of KEQ 
We always write the KEQ expression, then we solve for it. So let's like, take a look. We're given an equation. We're given concentrations of reactants and products. So let's work through this very carefully. Calculating KEQ. So in number one, our approach is first to write the KEQ expression. We've got hydrogen iodide squared concentration over hydrogen gas concentration iodine gas concentration. So I write the KEQ expression. Now I'm going to plug in those concentrations that have been provided. Now when you write concentration, you need the brackets. When you plug in the values, you don't need brackets anymore. I usually use parentheses because it's easier to read. And just make sure that you plug in the correct concentration. And we may need to review a little bit with our calculator. I should have a capital M there, sorry. Even though we don't use the units at the end, but should put them in properly. Is that showing up on the screen? Yes? Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Now, in your calculator, the only parentheses that you need are the ones in red. And remember, instead of times 10, we're hitting our EE buttons or EXP buttons, or if you have that fabulous multi-view times 10 to the N, it says there. So plug it in, and you should do this with me because you don't want to make a calculator error. And KEQ is equal to 56. Did we get that? If you have a multi-view, you will need multiple sets of parentheses. If you have the multi-view, you'll need all of those parentheses on the bottom. That's why it's not my favorite. Anytime you have times 10 to the, with the multi-view, you need a set of parentheses. So you'll need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 parentheses with the multi-view. So I, I have some other calculators if you want to borrow. Did you get it right? Okay. Well, you guys know how to use those, so you're good. So when you're calculating KEQ, you write the KEQ expression. And then you plug in the values, or the quantities, and solve. You try number two. I'll put two back on the screen. I'm going to put it at the tippy top so your eye doesn't slip. And I'll do number two also. Make sure you write the expression first.
how we feeling? Got it? How many circles? Two. Blue ones? No, you like this one. Blue ones, me. That's what I did. <laughs> All right. Now, again, with the multi view, the denominator is a little trickier. I can work on that with you when you sit down to problem solve. Okay. All right. So when you go to calculate KEQ, you first write the expression, and then you plug in the values and solve it. And your quiz will open up very similarly. I'll give you an equation. I'll ask you to write the KEQ expression. I'll say write the equilibrium constant expression. I'll ask you to solve it and interpret it. And I'll show you how to interpret it here. All right. So when you're interpreting values for KEQ, it says if KEQ is greater than 1, then product concentration is greater than reactant concentration. Let's look at the interpretation a little more simplistically so that you fully understand it. If you have KEQ is equal to the concentration of products, over the concentration of reactants, okay? If KEQ is greater than 1, you can see here that that means that product concentration is greater than reactant. If product concentration is greater than the reactant, does it appear that the forward reaction is favored or the reverse? Forward, because you have more product. So if KEQ is greater than 1, then product concentration is greater than reactant concentration, and clearly the forward reaction must be favored to generate more product than you have reactant. If KEQ is less than 1, now, it can't be negative, all right? So it's less than 1. It's like 2 times 10 to the negative third. If KEQ is less than 1, now you can see the way you get something less than 1 is if reactant concentration is greater than product concentration. If reactant concentration is greater than product concentration, now the reverse reaction is favored because you have more reactant than you do product. And this is all written in your notes. I just want you to see it mathematically. If KEQ is equal to 1, what can you say about reactant and product concentration? They have to be the same or equal. So if these two values are the same, then KEQ is equal to 1, and now you're at 
equilibrium, okay? So when product concentration is greater, the forward reaction is favored. That gives rise to a KEQ greater than one. When reacting concentration is greater than product, the reverse reaction is favored. And that's what we're looking at here. So I like to do things mathematically because I like math and I think it's easier to interpret than to memorize. So if you understand the concept, you'll do better, especially if you're a little bit nervous on an assessment. All right, so this, as I said, is all in your notes. I just like to look at it mathematically. If KEQ is greater than one, we established product concentrations greater than reacting concentration. The forward reaction is favored. If KEQ is huge, much greater than one, typically greater than 10 to the 10th power, your reaction's not reversible anymore. It just goes in the forward direction. If KEQ is less than one, <coughs> reacting concentrations less than product concentration, so you're not making much, that means that the reverse reaction is favored. As we mentioned before, KEQ only remains constant with constant temperature. We'll come back to that later on. And if you have KEQ equal to 1, you're at a state of equilibrium because the concentrations of reactants and products are equal. So it says determine if the forward or reverse reaction is favored in each of the previous problems. Explain your reasoning. Let's do that before we do the italicized piece. So in the previous problems, we first got a KEQ of 56. Is that greater than 1? Yes. yes. So this is greater than 1. That means the forward reaction is favored. In the second problem, we got a KEQ of 38,000. So which reaction is favored? Forward or reverse? Forward. Why? KEQ is greater than 1. We're going to stay away from it. Okay, so let's do one more because we didn't get one where the reverse is favored. So let's say let's say that if KEQ was equal to 3.0 times 10 to the negative fourth. Would the forward or reverse reaction be favored? So we would say the reverse reaction is favored because KEQ is less than 1. Okay? The other question says, what would be the value of KEQ at equilibrium? So at equilibrium... KEQ is equal to what? One. one. Here's a tricky one. It says, what's the value of delta G? <coughs> Let's think about this. A thermodynamically favorable reaction has a positive or negative delta G? Negative. 
a thermodynamically unfavorable reaction has a positive delta G. So what would you guess delta G would be at equilibrium? Zero is correct. Good girl. Sarah, get some paper towels for that because you're dripping. No, you can drink it. Just need some paper towels. Connor will get them for you. All right. Well, we know that delta G is negative for a thermodynamically favorable reaction. It's positive for a thermodynamically unfavorable reaction. So at equilibrium, delta G has to be zero, somewhere in between. All right? All right, this is the very last section, and it's the super-duper math part. You already know how to do it. It's just a matter of solving correctly. All right? You can do it. Last section, and then we'll do some practice in the lab and all that good stuff. <coughs> this one's the most fun. We know how to write KEQ expressions. We know how to solve them. We know how to interpret them, but we do need practice. Because chemistry is a lot like math. The more practice you do, the stronger you're going to be. Those of you doing a lot of practice or nailing everything, and those of you just looking at the answers, it can be hit or miss, so be careful there. It says the concentrations of reactants or products can be calculated when a value of KEQ is provided, as well as some concentrations of substances. Examples, use the equation and information provided to calculate the concentration of the valueless substance. So now we're going to be given KEQ, given all the concentrations except one, and we're going to solve for the missing piece. This is just a math exercise being able to manipulate variables in equations. Most of you are extremely strong at this. Those of you who aren't, we're going to get you strong at this before the end of the period. All righty. I'm going to do the first several with you. Then you're going to do some with me. And then you will fly on your own. No. I can't push you out of the nest. I keep you forever. I can't let go. All righty. Although I'm ready for my daughter to go to college now. She's 12. Okay, number one. No, 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 no. Let's focus, let's focus. Your parents never let you go. They're always your parents. All right, we are generating hydrogen iodide. We're generating hydrogen iodide gas from hydrogen and iodine. Regardless of what they ask you to do, your approach is always the same. The first thing you do is you write the KEQ expression. Raise your hand and help me write it. All right, Brianna. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you. Just like how Brianna helped me earlier. All right. So KEQ is equal to hydrogen iodide plus No, you did a better job. Hydrogen iodide. Don't listen to him. Raise to the power of? Two. Good. Over hydrogen to the second power. Right, to the first power to the coefficient of one and iodine. Good. So that's our first. Now, I know you guys like to put quantities in before you solve. I don't recommend that. I like to... Um, I really like to manipulate my variables, so I'm solving for this piece right here. And I like to manipulate... Pardon the interruption, teachers, all AP students are returning to their classes now. Once again, all AP students are returning to their classes now. I'm going to cross multiply to solve.
as such. So all I did was cross multiply to solve for the variable I want. Now I don't want hydrogen iodide concentration squared. I only want it to the first power. There are a couple of ways you can approach this. Most of you just say, okay, take the square root of both sides, which is fine. There's another way to approach it, which I'll mention here. It'll come into play more in the next few sections. If I want hydrogen iodide concentration to the first power, two times what fraction is one? One half. So I'm basically taking this to the one half and this to the one half. I mention it here. You'll see it again in a few minutes. So we're going to solve for hydrogen iodide concentration now by taking the square root of both sides. Bless you. Once you have everything set, you're ready to plug in and solve. KEQ is 56. Hydrogen concentration is 0 0.0091. Iodine concentration is 5.9 times 10 to the negative fourth molar. You don't need any, mm, you probably need parentheses if you have a multi-view. So be careful with that little calculator. And I get a concentration of 0.017 molar, you need that unit, or 1.7 times 10 to the negative 2 molar, if you prefer scientific notation. Okay? Alright, so there's your concentration. So you can see how I systematically solved. I wrote the KEQ expression, I manipulated my variables, I solved. Let's do, we're going to do two more together, at least two more together. I've got five here. Alright, questions on the first. Right, KEQ is unitless, but the unit for concentration is molarity, so you will put them in. The only thing I didn't do here is I didn't put an M here, and I should have. Capital M for molarity. That should be capital. Big one. Sloppy, sloppy. Minus one. Alrighty. Let's try another one. We'll use purple this time. All right, same approach, and it's going to get crankier and crankier, so we have to be really careful, and we have to remember no liquids, no solids, because I give you information about them, but you do not use liquids or solids in KEQ expressions. All righty, number two. Who wants to help? Dawson, how do you write it? Here, I'll help you, KEQ. <laughs> Oh, somebody will help you. Don't you worry. Sydney, go ahead. And how come we included water here? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a gas. There's lots of Sydneys in here. Okay, go ahead. Um, 
for the first power or nothing. All right. Now, what are we solving for? Okay, I'm going to teach you a trick that you're going to love, but you only can do it in certain instances. If you have a numerator on one side of the equation and a denominator on the other side of the equation, you can switch them. If you don't believe me, cross multiply and solve. But it only works with a numerator on one side and a denominator on the other side. You cannot use this trick for two numerators or two denominators. So be careful. You can see it because if you do this times this times this equals this times this, you would divide by both of these. This would be here. So you can interchange those two. Prove it to yourself by cross multiplying it if you wish. But this is a great time saving trick that will never fail you. Okay? So you can interchange the numerator on one side, the denominator on the other. Of course. And now once you've set it up, you're going to plug and solve. I know some of you are just coming in. We are filming, but when we do the next problem, we will be sure to go over all the ins and outs, so hopefully it's um, clear to you. Be very careful as you plug everything in. Don't lose any exponents. With all calculators except those wonderful multi-views, you can just use the red parentheses. If you have the multi-view, you probably need every set up there, so be very, very careful. And you can always check your answer. It's not a bad idea to make sure that you do not make a calculation error. That's where a lot of kids lose points. Also, be very clear in your setup. If you don't set your problem up correctly, you cannot get points because it will be unclear what your error is. And like I said, you can go back in to your expression to make sure you are solving properly. It's not a bad idea, and it will eliminate careless errors. Okay? oxygen concentration. And I'm going to take all of these and scan them and put them up to Edline as well. Okay? So those of you just coming in, don't feel lost. We'll find you somewhere.
we're going to do another one together and then you'll tell me where you're at. I think you'll be able to do the other ones. All right, in number three, this problem's a little tricky on multiple levels. So let's take a look at number three and figure out what's going on. When you look at the balanced equation, what do you notice that's a little bit problematic for KEQ expressions? There's a liquid. So we do not include solids or liquids in KEQ expressions. So what's happening here is we're given the concentrations of everything except one of the ions and we're provided with the KEQ value. First of all, looking at that KEQ value, just to review, with the KEQ of 2.3 times 10 to the third power is the forward or reverse reaction favored and why? The forward reaction is favored because KEQ is greater than one. So product concentration is greater than reactant concentration. Now let's go how to review. I'm going to do this one in a little more detail than what most of you need just to get our other guys caught up. So our approach is always to write the KEQ expression. KEQ is equal to the concentration of products for aqueous and gaseous, gaseous substances only. So I've got this crazy complex ion, but I did this on purpose because your lab has this exact equation in reverse. Chloride ion to the fourth power. The stoichiometric coefficient becomes the exponent. And we're going to divide this by the concentration of this complex ion. And we're not going to include the water here because water is a liquid. I want to solve for the chloride ion concentration. There's really no flipperoo easy peasy type way to approach this. So I'm going to cross multiply. And then I'm going to solve for this by dividing both sides. And now, this gets back to what I had mentioned previously. I don't want chloride ion to the fourth power. I want it to the first power. Four times what fraction is one? One fourth. So to solve for the chloride ion concentration, I've got KEQ, concentration of the chloride ion, over this concentration, mm -hmm. and I'm going to take that to the one fourth power. You can do arrow up parentheses one divided by four, or you can do arrow up 0.25. Once you've got it all set up, now you are ready to pop in those quantities that are provided. I really like to set it up prior to solving. So I have 2.3 times 10 to the third. KEQs do not have units. We keep it simple. Just find your ion concentrations now. Don't forget to take it to the one-fourth power. That's a common error that kids make. And 
don't forget the unit of concentration, molarity. And again, in the calculator here, you do arrow up, parenthesis, 1 divided by 4, or arrow up, 0.25. Some of your calculators are a little bit different. Make sure you know how to take something to a fractional power. I can help you with that. So you write your KEQ expression, you solve for the concentration moving variables, you plug in your quantities, don't forget to take it to the correct power. It takes practice, I think you have all the tools now you need to be successful here. I'm going to give you a break. You will need to do numbers 4 and 5 in your note packet. I will write down what classworks you can do as well. And we also have the lab to work on. We didn't finish very much yet today. So you're going to do four and five, and I'll solve them here as well, okay? So you want to do four and five. I'll do those on the next page. For your classwork, 4.3, you can do one through eight. Now I, with this really kooky little schedule, I don't see you again until Wednesday the 27th. I would like one through eight done then because we're going to go over Le Chatelier's principle then and we'll be looking to quiz. I, I gotta look at that. I I don't know. I, I, let me look at the schedule. It's either gonna be the 28th or the third. Um, it's it's a it's a bit of a mess. And the other kids are gonna get the weekend and maybe you should too, but I'll take a look at that. I also just want to see when your ACE testing is because I don't, I don't want to give you something crazy at that time because it's too much for you. Um, all right, so we're going to take a short break. You will need to do four and five in your note packet and then one through eight in the classwork.